Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Savannah House, and I'm a mixed animal practitioner in Drayton Valley. Um, and so, a uh, little bit different than many people in the room um, in that I'm not currently a beekeeper and I'm also not a researcher. And so instead, um, I'm the type of person where, let's say, you require a prescription of oxytetracycline and you're not sure where to go because now you need a prescription for oxytetracycline. You might call around to local veterinary clinics because you require a veterinary prescription and who you're going to find is somebody like me. <laughs> So, um, I was asked to do this talk. I had uh, given another talk uh, earlier, uh, sorry, I guess it would be last year now, um, where I was talking about the role that veterinarians on the ground, is what we call ourselves, um, in private practice, what kind of role they're going to play in both hobbyist and commercial beekeeping operations. And so, this was one section of a larger presentation that was given. It's going to be a lot, maybe it's good that I'm right before lunch, it's going to be a lot simpler than other presentations that you'll see this weekend, or this, it's not even the weekend, I don't even know what day it is. Um, <laughs> so, but the purpose of my talk, what I want you to take away from my talk is something very practical, very usable, something that you can take and implement right away into your production because that's what private practitioners are good at. We're really good at the practical side of things. And so what I'm hoping you can use this information for is not only developing your own biosecurity plan, but instructing and educating and teaching the people that are working with your production. Because that's really where your biosecurity is gonna make or break, is really the people that are actually interacting with the bees and the colonies. So uh, let's see if I break this or if it wants to work. Oh, good. So that's me and another veterinarian in my practice. Um, and so I'm relatively new to honeybees. I've been working on bringing myself up to speed over the last three years, um, taking uh, individual continuing education courses, uh, getting some hands-on practice in hives, going to conferences. I went to North Carolina for a honeybee veterinary consortium conference in September. I didn't make it to Apomania, but hopefully one year I'll go to that. So, um, but yeah, so you have to be nice to me because I'm brand new at this. Um, and uh, the veterinary colleges are recognizing that there's a demand and I think a, there really is a role that veterinarians can play in production with honeybees and I'm hoping that I can show at least one of the ways that veterinarians can help with this and we're working on uh, improving honeybee, I guess, competency in the veterinary profession. So uh, the first, what I want to do is talk about... Oops, don't want to do that, that's the opposite. So I want to talk about biosecurity in the apiary. Since that's one area of beekeeping, I think the veterinarians will really shine and actually have a big impact on your apiary's productivity um, because this is what we do in every other species. For example, if I get called out to a herd health call in my cow-calf operations, this is a large part of what I'm doing. If I'm called out to my feedlot operators, my sheep and goat producers, everybody, those other species that are food producing animals, this is the role that veterinarians play. So we're not feedlot managers. What I do instead is I recommend biosecurity protocols. We see that it's working. I take, and sometimes I, I don't even often take the lab samples. A lot of times the feedlot employees are taking lab samples, but I'll help interpret the results and try to fit it into the biosecurity program and see where breaches happen, that kind of thing. So that's really the role that a food animal production veterinarian will do. Um, and so, because biosecurity is so complicated and so individual, that's also where our role is because a veterinarian should be able to make a customized biosecurity plan for your particular production and the area that you're in. Um, and so I'll start by defining biosecurity, talk about the importance of it, and then go over how to develop a biosecurity plan. Um, it, this is a monster sized topic <laughs> and I'm not gonna cover it in great detail because I have half an hour. And so I'll ask that we keep most questions to the end if we can so that I can get through as much as possible. So what is biosecurity? This is the simplest definition I could come up with and find. It's safety measures taken to protect against disease. In practice, it's management decisions that reduce the risk of spreading disease and introducing disease, and everybody needs a plan for biosecurity. I don't care if you have two hives, or 2,000, or 20,000, everybody needs a biosecurity plan. And it's very important because it limits and ideally prevents transmission of disease, minimizes production losses, minimizes, minimizes production costs, minimizes antimicrobial and pesticide usage, and something that's really up and coming is considering the welfare of the bees. So um, considering things like 
you know, we don't, we don't like seeing fields of dead bees when we have something nasty go through or because we've had a breach in biosecurity and now we have to burn half our hives or something like that, right? So that's everything that we want to avoid. Um, and so the other thing I want to keep as our focus on biosecurity is the reason that I'm up here at all <laughs> when vets haven't traditionally been involved with hives is because of regulations that changed around the use of medically important antimicrobial substances. So in December 2018 is when that finally went through. This is actually coming from Alberta, uh, not Alberta, sorry, Canada Public Health and Canada Health. And there's also multiple international agreements that this is an adherence to. So for everybody that thinks it's vets trying to make money, I swear to God it's not because not only do we not make a ton of money off of it, but it's a lot of paperwork and headache. But I think it's gonna be worthwhile in the end because the reason these regulations and these new prescription laws are being put in place is that we are having misuse and overuse of antimicrobial substances that is leading to antimicrobial resistance. As you saw, Alberta has the highest rate of antimicrobial resistance with our European foul brood strains. And a large part of this is from overuse and misuse of antimicrobial drugs, especially as a prophylactic use. It's not just honeybees. We see this in poultry. We see this in swine. We see this in bovine. I see it in all the species that I deal with. And so as we move forward into a very possibly post-antibiotic world, we need to figure out how to deal with disease in ways that doesn't involve reaching for a bag of oxytetracycline or a bottle of Tylosin or anything like that. So um, that's really the goal of biosecurity, is to minimize use of those things. And eventually one day when we maybe can't use them, we still need a way to deal with disease. So uh, there's a lot of really good resources out there about biosecurity, because like I said, it's a monster-sized topic. It's huge. This is taken from the Canadian Best Management Practices for Honeybee Health Manual. This is a great summary uh, slide. And so what this is, it has different aspects of biosecurity practices for you to actually implement and to consider when developing your biosecurity plan. I think you can get this as a PDF free online. I have a printed copy because I'm actually old school and I love printed copies because I can take it into the field with me easier where there's no Wi-Fi. Um, and so you can get this for free online. It's got fantastic information on there. It's actually an industry harmonization uh, document. So it actually um, considers the practices that we see across the country and, and uh, considers best practices in all these different realms. So what I did to make things uh, simple is I broke it down. I like things simple. Uh, life's complicated enough. So taking a huge complicated topic like biosecurity, I break it down into three steps. Step one, you need to assess your biosecurity. So you need to know where you're at, you need to know where your problems are, you need to know how it's gonna fit in your apiary. Uh, these are some of your resources of where you're going to get an assessment of your biosecurity. So in an ideal world, it would be similar to other species where you could consider a veterinarian as somebody that you would call out to do a biosecurity assessment. I think in Europe they call it a sanitary evaluation or something like that. Um, anyways, uh, that's something we do in other species, and so having a veterinarian out for a biosecurity assessment and review of records ideally would benefit the profitability and disease management of a production apiary by creating a customized biosecurity plan. Currently, we don't have enough veterinarians that even know what end of a bumblebee is which, or whether a bumblebee is actually a honeybee or a leafcutter bee, so we're not quite there yet but we're working on it. So at some point in future, when we have more veterinarians that are well-versed in honeybee pathology and honeybee disease and honeybee management, um, I think one day, hopefully we'll get there. In the meantime, we have our provincial apiarist office <laughs> who does the grunt work. They do the vast majority of this, if not most, I would argue all of it at this point, essentially, um, where they will examine your hive, look for disease, do certain disease testing, and can provide information about biosecurity practices. Um, and so, yeah, ideally we have a, what I would love to see as well is a similar relationship between veterinarians and the provincial apiarist office as what we see with like our poultry, with our, our cattle, where we work with the government um, in doing similar jobs, but a lot of times what happens is we end up doing a lot of like the field work and then reporting back to the government because they only have so many employees and half the time they're tied up whether or not they have funding to do things half the time. So. Um, in an ideal situation in most other species, what we use is our on the ground veterinarians as our initial disease surveillance kind of flow feelers for disease. And then we feed that information back up to the government. Um, maybe one day we'll get to that point with bees, but again, we have to get our vets up to speed first. Um, 
There is also self-assessment available. Uh, with this other document here, this beastly one here from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, this is actually the Honey Bee Producer Guide to the National Bee Farm Level Biosecurity Standard. There's a self-assessment back here, so you can actually assess your own hives if you feel comfortable and confident doing it. And I would encourage that everybody does a self-assessment anyway, so that you, it's, a, it's a really great way to think about biosecurity in your production. And then if you come across any areas you're not sure about, that would be a good time to contact uh, either the apiarist office or a veterinarian that's well-versed in honey bee management. So once you've had your assessment and you realize where the weak points are, what you need to work on, that's when you come up with your biosecurity plan. And that's the part I'll kind of break down today so that you know what to put into your plan. And then third, you actually have to use it. It's weird, I know, but you have to actually use your plan. And that's why I like to keep it simple because if it's too complicated, you're not gonna do it. If it too, takes too much time, if it's too difficult to do it, if it's too confusing, your people that are on the ground working with your hives aren't going to use it, you're not going to use it, nobody's going to review it, it's not going to do anything for you. So you need to train everybody involved with your apiary on, they need to be familiar with it, they need to understand why it's important, and they need to uh, reevaluate yearly, ideally, because things change um, year to year with how, like, who's working there, how it's working, are some things too cumbersome, are things not working out for you. So. Yeah, that's ideally what you should do. So this is the biosecurity plan. I made it as short, sweet, to the point as I can. <laughs> uh, these are the major headings. Think of this like if you had a binder, these would be each of your chapters. Um, and we'll go through, I'll go through each of these as hopefully as quickly and painlessly as I can. Um, this is somewhat adapted from that nice little like pictograph or whatever. I like lists. I find they're easier to work with. They're easier. This is a lot more concrete than fun little pictures so you can easily make a binder and actually if I went when I do herd health this is exactly what I do is I make a book and I have headings and I put information in each heading and I will have people like with my my goats and my sheep and my chickens and my cows or whatever they get a herd health binder and they have to add to it and I add to it as well but these are kind of some of my basic headings that I go with. So first is sourcing and traceability. Work very closely with your provincial apiarist office because this is who is actually going to be following up and actually doing a lot of this. Um, so things like, um, I'm not even gonna pretend to know exactly what Sam and her group do because they do a ton of stuff. Um, but they will do things like uh, inspect hives for movement between provinces. Uh, you can do uh, actual on the ground hive inspections as well. Um, there's lots of registration requirements for your hives as well as your equipment, as I'm sure you're all aware. Even if you don't have bees and you have equipment, you still have to register it, and I hope you're doing that. Otherwise, Sam's here and she'll come find you. No. <laughs> and so um, in other species, this is the, often the relationship we see with veterinarians is veterinarians will be doing um, certifications. Like, for example, if you're CFI accredited, you'll be doing things like uh, import and export certificates for cattle. Um, Maybe one day we could have that with bees, take some of the workload off of Sam and her group, but at this point, that's who you're gonna to go to for all of your traceability. So if you're, say, for example, moving your hives to overwinter in BC, all of your hives need to be, well, not all of them, but they need to be certified and they need to go through the provincial apiarist office so that we keep track of movement of where they're going. It sounds like a pain in the butt, but the reason we do it is so that we can tr track disease outbreaks and know where point sources are coming from and see if your hives are at risk if an outbreak does happen. <coughs> Um, and there's tons of great examples where that system works and we've seen it work in, in honeybees, like the small hive beetle outbreaks, like because of traceability, we knew which hives were where and we knew which ones were affected and could keep track of that. So that's the main reason that we do it. It's not to, it's, it's not to be really, you know, big government is spying on you. I promise it's actually for disease management and disease control. Um, keeping track of hive movement within your own operation. This is one area that I think everybody could, could probably work on. Um, so this is like keeping track of equipment. So numbering hive boxes, numbering frames, um, keeping track of which hives are going where, uh, which apiary, like which yard they're in, that kind of thing. And this is important because if you, all of a sudden in your, in, when you're doing surveillance, you find, oh, this hive is infected with AFB, who else has been in contact with that? What equipment has been in contact with these bees? All of those things. And so you need a really robust equipment management system and a way to keep track of where hives are going. And it gets really, it can be really cumbersome. Um, some people even use things like barcodes and stuff like that to streamline it. So there's lots of different ways to make it work within your operation so that it's useful and helpful. And uh, yeah, so I highly recommend uh, coming up with a good system to track all this good stuff. 
Uh, sourcing bees and equipment from a trusted supplier. I find where I have the biggest issue with this is the hobbyists, um, because they'll just pick up bees from wherever. And so um, ideally you should have a supplier that has record of inspections that have been done, import export records. They should have a documented disease and pest management program that if you ask to see it or go over it, they can easily do that for you. Um, so that's all good information that they should be able to have for you. So next, integrated pest management. Um, this is a huge topic, oddly enough, hence why there is an entire two-day workshop today on it. Um, it's highly individualized for each apiary, so I'm just going to very briefly go over this and how it fits into a biosecurity plan. Basically, have a very specific written plan. You're more likely to actually follow through with it if you write it down, and it's very clear to follow, especially if you have employees. It's so much easier for employees to follow an SOP or follow a list of things they need to be doing and checking for and when. You're more likely to have success with your plan than to say, we need to check for Varroa. Okay, but we need to know when, we need to know what method, we need to know what to do when we get positive results. So these are all things that you have to think about and actually write down. I've put down some examples, like keeping track of requeening events, however you're requeening, um, having a specific rural management plan. If you haven't checked out that website, highly recommend it. These tools are amazing for coming up with your own personalized rural management plan. Anytime I have somebody come with me and, they, and I, they ask me for advice and I ask, what's your rural management plan? If you don't have an answer for me, that's where we're starting. <laughs> so ideally you should have a very separate specific rural management plan. Um, I also want people to plan out disease monitoring. So this includes things like um, figuring out when are you going to submit samples? When does that fit in your production cycle? When is that gonna be the best time for you to get the best answer and the best bang for your buck because it's not cheap doing testing. You need to know what actions you're going to take if you get a positive sample. You need to know, um, you know what your options are based on what time of year it is, how much time there is left in the production cycle, whether there's a honey flow on, and you also need to create a budget for diagnostic testing because as you saw, it's not inexpensive. And honestly, those prices that were posted earlier would be similar to what a private practitioner would probably charge when you include mileage, time, lab testing, that kind of thing. I mean, obviously we can work with you and make it a bit cheaper in some cases, but really that's, that's the actual cost of doing this kind of thing. And so including it as part of your budget is very, very important. And that's also why it's important to think about your integrated pest management so that you get your best test results possible. And that's always what I counsel like my, my bovine clients and stuff like that. I'm like, I don't, I don't really care about doing fecal flotations and PCR panels in January. None of the bugs are reproducing. They're all insisted strong gels at this point. I don't really give a rip. I want to know mid-July. <laughs> so don't spend your money in January, spend it in July. So that's something you have to think about with honeybees as well, is figuring out when's the best time to test so that you actually get good answers. Um, separate healthy from not healthy. Uh, sounds uh, easy, but it's not. <laughs> it sounds simple, and it's not. So in every species, quarantine is crucial. I find quarantine is difficult in bees because they go out into the environment and do their own thing. So really having a separate yard with separate equipment that is treated last compared to your actual other apiaries is the ideal. And ideally they'd be 10 kilometers away from any other hive. Not everybody has that, but this is the ideal that you would want to work towards. And there's lots of good reasons to quarantine and you want to do it for a full brood cycle. It's so that if you did bring in some, some bees and they did harbor some kind of disease, ideally we should see brood diseases, which are gonna be the most common issues you have um, with bringing new uh, stock in, is you want to see in that full brood cycle if there's any signs of brood disease. And if there is, at least you didn't unleash a bomb into the rest of your apiary and you've limited and mitigated the damage. Um, you can also have a hospital apiary, which is a, an area if you're going to be pursuing treatment, like for example, if you're doing things like shook swarm methods and that kind of stuff for EFB, um, it's nice to have a hospital uh, apiary so that they're not contaminating and, and drifting and doing anything with your other hives and spreading disease. Um, we wanna minimize drifting and robbing between hives, which is very, very difficult in some operations and so it might require some creativity on everybody's part. Um, it's, yeah, sometimes it's almost impossible, but I always try to say, you know, we want to minimize, try to get the least amount as possible. Um, we also want to track and control movement of equipment, which was kind of back in the sourcing and uh, traceability. That's why that's so important, because if you realize that this particular hive is an absolute Varroa bomb, you want to know, did it go to apiary? Did it go to yard B? Did it go to yard C? Who do we have to go and target our testing and, and monitoring and that kind of thing? The last one is controlling visitors to the hive. Again, that's gonna be highly individual. Visitors range anything from 
uh, people that you have over, like if you're a hobbyist, this is really bad because they let random people come and fart around in their hives all the time and people like to go to these hives even though there's bees stinging them. Like I don't get it, they just gravitate towards them, but whatever. It includes things like, um, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and so that's one example of visitor, but other things to consider, veterinarians are huge fomites. We are terrible. And so we are very cognizant of the fact that we spread disease if we're not careful. Because if I go to one bee yard, oh crap, you got AFB. I'm gonna go drive over to Farmer John's place. Oh, I didn't change any of my clothes and now you got AFB. So veterinarians are very cognizant of the fact that we can be a potential for a disease spread. And I always, uh, when I'm planning out my herd health visits, I try to not see the same species on the same day if I can help it. Because <laughs> um, these are things like, you gotta consider the, your vehicles. Like for example, um, uh, if you, for let's say one of your farm hands spills some honey when he's like moving it into the truck, he drives into town, I've seen it before, there's a bunch of bees flying out of the box of his truck. And what if he had gone to his neighbors who also has bees and now we've got drift and let's say we've got disease spread that way. Like that's a perfect situation that probably happens more than we care to think about. Um, other things that include control of visitors is if you have somebody coming in like a veterinarian, ideally get them to use your own equipment so that we're not bringing our dirty hive tools and poking around in your hives and spreading stuff. Ideally, we won't be offended. We will use your stuff. And that's one way to control introduction of disease into your apiaries when somebody that's high risk, such as a veterinarian or, I mean, even the provincial apiarist office, I mean, they're, they're going to all sorts of different places, right? So the disease potential's there. Um, so that's definitely something to be considered. Um, and then next section, I hope I'm not going too fast. I've got so much info. <laughs> um, and I feel like this is all very superficial. And so this is again, like a very, I wanna keep it simple so that you, you have the opportunity to, to like structure how you wanna go about developing your plan and then add to this. This is all very, very broad based. Disease surveillance, I'm a huge fan of disease surveillance. Um, it's really hard to treat what you don't know is there. And if you have something like, let's say one year, you have an 80% winter kill rate, wouldn't it be great to know why that happened? So hopefully it doesn't happen next year. Um, disease surveillance is a crucial component of management that helps you figure out those sorts of problems. And this is also the area of apiary management where you're most likely to involve a veterinarian because you may require antimicrobial treatments if that's the way that you want to approach the disease management. This is part of constructing what's called a veterinary client patient relationship, which is where we have documentation that there is a disease present that requires the antimicrobial, and this is why we're using it. So this is critical to having access to antimicrobials that are medically important. So um, depending on what you're looking for and time of year and what problems you've got going on, these are all some of the basic disease surveillance things that, that I'll recommend people do. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the National Bee Diagnostic Center, so they do all sorts of good stuff for us. Um, I'm really happy that we have them in the province. We don't have something similar and as inexpensive as the National Bee Diagnostic Center compared with other species. We used to. Um, surveillance used to be a lot cheaper in the province, but then government funding cuts makes it. So it's usually going through private labs now. And so it's much more expensive in other species compared to bees. So you guys are lucky. You're, you're good on that front. <laughs> and so especially because you can have direct uh, producer submitted samples, which I think is great. Um, if you are, if you're having hobbyists though, a lot of times I just encourage the hobbyists, please contact the apiarist office or a vet uh, confident in honeybee pathology because a lot of times they're gonna take the wrong samples. But if you're confident knowing what samples to take, <laughs> uh, by all means, definitely utilize these services. Um, and I guess I should make as a side note, if you, for example, let's say you have positive culture results for EFB, it is sensitive to oxytetracycline, um, and you go to a veterinary clinic to, to get a prescription of oxytetracycline, uh, be prepared to answer a lot of the questions that I've already covered with biosecurity because not, we can't just hand out the prescription because you have a positive culture result, especially with EFB, we need to know what you're doing to minimize stressors in your apiary so that we're minimizing antimicrobial use because it goes to that next level of what are we doing to reduce our use of antimicrobials, particularly in food producing animals. So. Um, when I have people come in saying, hey, I need OxyTet, I've got EFB, here's my culture results. I'm like, okay, cool. What else are you doing? Where are your records? You know, what's your feeding management strategies? That kind of stuff. So I promise it's not because we are interrogating you. It's so that we can make sure we're using antimicrobials in an appropriate fashion. 
Um, we're all on the same side, I promise. <laughs> and so, yeah, disease surveillance is an excellent way to let us know what we're dealing with, what kind of problems, and where we have to tighten up our biosecurity. That's their new website. Uh, it's fabulous. I love it. And then this one is huge, hygiene. Hygiene is fantastic. And actually, most diseases and most management problems often stem and go back to hygiene and hygiene practices. This is also where you're going to have to spend the most, in my opinion, the most time training your staff is hygiene and uh, continually going over hygienic practices, reviewing them, making sure it's working, making sure people are doing it because just because you make an SOP doesn't mean people are following it. Um, and so maintenance and a lot of this stuff seems self-explanatory, you know, like maintenance and repairs. You want to make sure that your hives are in good condition. They're not drafty. They're not leaking. They're not covered in all sorts of gross stuff, um, equipment exchange and replacement. So I know there's lots of information out there about how often to replace your frames, uh, disinfecting equipment, but all of these things in your biosecurity plan, you should have very specific instructions. Like for example, with the equipment exchange and replacement, I want you to decide it down to this many frames are being exchanged per year on average for each hive, and then have a criteria for which ones are getting switched out because then you can pass that on to people that you're working with or you can keep that in mind yourself to make sure that it's actually happening. Because it's one thing to say, oh yeah, we'll just change out some frames. But you're more likely to have success if you know you're removing three frames per year, per brood box, and this is our criteria. If it's black as midnight, don't keep it. Um, <laughs> so keep making it very specific is the best way to maximize the efficacy of the hygienic practices you want to implement. Um, there's tons of information about all of this stuff in different extension services. In that biosecurity book, this, uh, this beefy one here from the CFIA has some recommendations as well. I think the industry standards one, like there's information out there. And so then what you need to do is take that information, fit it into your plan and your production because that's, and that's often where for my other species, I find myself employed and, and actually being useful is trying to decide in your situation what's the best way to go about doing this. Uh, because it's one thing to have, you know, some, some operations will be really great with the hygiene, others are gonna be having problems, you know, there's gonna be lots of different considerations, lots of different personal opinions, like about how to manage feed. I think we're having some, some nutrition talks coming up, it's a big topic, and there's lots of different opinions about how we feed our bees. Um, and so all of those things need to be personalized and, and uh, made useful for you. And this is really where I find a lot of places, um, even if you're awesome, there's almost always room for improvement in our hygiene practices. And it's really going to minimize our level of stress in the bees. It's gonna minimize our disease transmission and spread as well. Um, so yeah, that one's massive. And last but not least, record keeping. Everybody loves bookkeeping. Paperwork is so much fun. <laughs> so it's very important to have good record keeping. And again, with my theme of the day is find a system that works for you because if you have a record keeping system that you hate, a record keeping system you don't use, or a system that you can't get information out of, it's not a good record keeping system for you. So you need to have paperwork or you need to have a system of some sort where you can spot trends, you can spot disease issues easier with good record keeping, you can spot where you're losing money easier with good record keeping. You know, like if you notice like, hey, so and so has like, you know, let's say this yard has a huge turnover of equipment versus this one. Turns out the person who's working in yard A likes to drop frames all the time and they keep getting smashed and you keep having to replace them. Like something as simple as that you can actually flag that on record keeping and you can actually save your operation money. And so very meticulous and detail-oriented record keeping is extremely important. There's so many different templates. Um, I think there's some templates in the, the biosecurity handbook here. There's plenty that are out there. You can make your own, whatever you find useful, whatever you want to use. You can use a combination of hard copy and digital. You can go all digital, all hard copy. Um, there's lots of really cool programs that are out there. The other important thing is training everybody involved with how to use the record keeping system and make sure they actually use it. So that's where I find many places a hybrid of digital and hard copy is helpful where you have hard copy actually on like on the ground like while you're there, like keep track of things, transfer it digital afterwards so that it's easier to bring it up and find it down the line instead of sorting through binders that are crammed together on a shelf. 
Um, <laughs> and everybody has to know how to use it. Everybody has to use it consistently. This is also a critical component of developing that VCPR that I mentioned, um, because that's often, at a, when we're doing a herd health uh, evaluation, that's one of the first things I ask, is I need to see your records. And we'll be looking for things like, what are our production targets? What are your goals? Have we met them? Um, what are your test results from all your disease surveillance? What are your SOPs looking like? I need to see all of these records. And when we look at this information, then we can get an overarching view of how the operation is doing and maybe pinpoint where we're having problems. And this is also how you're going to find issues sooner rather than later. So record keeping can't be understated. It's really the glue that keeps the entire biosecurity plan together. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, very, very important, even though nobody likes to do it. And I highly recommend everybody, if you're, if you're internally wincing right now at the idea of going through your record keeping, that's probably a good indication it's not a system that's working for you. <laughs> and so should, uh, should work with uh, either the apiarist office or a veterinarian that's versed in bees to come up with a good record keeping system that's actually going to be helpful for you. Um, so in summary, because I think I'm a little over time. Um, Start, step one, assess your biosecurity risk. Step two, develop an apiary biosecurity plans. And step three, actually use it. Um, train and educate everybody about the biosecurity plan. Get everybody on board. Let them know why it's important. Reevaluate it yearly. Perform regular disease surveillance. And if something flags or there's a breach in your biosecurity and you notice that, that's when you want to work with your other beekeepers, your apiarist office, and hopefully one day your veterinarians that are versed in bee health to develop the best treatment plan uh, when we have biosecurity uh, breaches. So don't feel bad if your plan, if there's a gap in it or a biosecurity breach happens, it does happen. And that's why our surveillance and record keeping is in place so that when breaches happen, not if, when, we can catch it early before it gets everywhere and gets really expensive and difficult to treat. So there, that's the rough and dirty biosecurity plan. <laughs> um, hopefully that at least gives you something like really concrete and something you can take home and actually do um, and put together and make it something practical and useful for your operation. So yeah, I think that should be pretty much everything. <laughs>